In this video we're going to talk about weathering and we're going to talk about sedimentary rocks. So sedimentary rocks are really cool rocks that form layers and those layers are made up of sediment. So when we break up rock we're talking about weathering and we're producing sediment and if we have areas where that sediment collects and forms layers and gets compacted into sedimentary rock um, we get these really interesting layers of sedimentary rock and that tells us a lot about earth history. Okay, so when we talk about weathering, we're talking about breaking rock into smaller stuff. And there's two main ways that we do this. Number one is we have mechanical weathering, and that's just physically breaking rocks into smaller pieces. So you're smashing them up with some process into smaller stuff. Um, we also have chemical weathering, and that's breaking down rock um, chemically into uh, different kinds of minerals. Usually we're talking about dissolving minerals in water. Okay, one of the ways that we do um, mechanical weathering or physical weathering of rocks is with frost wedging and frost wedging happens when you where you have places where it gets hot and cold uh, where it gets cold enough to freeze water um, so we have cracks in rock and then uh, in those cracks in the rock water can seep in and if that water freezes um, well, water can break apart rock in sort of two ways. So one uh, is when it freezes, it expands, right? So water gets a little bit bigger. Think about if you uh, if you leave a case of beer out uh, on the back porch or something in winter, and then you go there the next day, and all the pot the tops have popped up, uh, and that's because the the beer froze and expanded. Um, but also. Um, more commonly, more water can get in and form these ice lenses. So think about how an icicle grows off your roof. Uh, more water dripping down and freezing makes that icicle bigger and bigger and bigger. And the same thing happens in cracks in rock, and that uh, will wedge these rocks apart. Another interesting way that we can weather rocks um, mechanically is with salt crystal growth. So this is a, a cliff face and this cliff uh, has sandstone layers and shale layers. So these thick layers here are mostly sandstone and we've got these sort of thin layers here of shale in between them. This is along the Colorado River in western Colorado. So sandstone is porous. Uh, it has big spaces uh, in between the sand grains that water or air can can fill, um, but but sa uh, but shale is is not very porous. It's made up of really small particles of of silt and clay, and so it's really finely compacted. And water can't get through those. So when it rains, okay, so it rains up here on the top of the cliff, and that rainwater kind of uh, percolates down through the sandstone because the sandstone's porous until it hits a shale layer. So it's a shale layer here, and that shale is impermeable. Right, so the water collects up in here. Now, when that water collects, uh, this is a pretty arid region, and so the water evaporates and it leaves behind salts. Any kind of salts that are dissolved in that water um, will be left behind, and then you get the growth of salt crystals. And so you see these little alcoves here, these little hollowed out areas. Those are always right above a shale layer where water collects and evaporates and salt crystals grow. And those little salt crystals, they grow just enough to wedge apart grains of sand uh, and create these little alcoves. And once they're created, then they start weathering um, bigger and bigger and bigger. So we have have lots of alcoves here. So when you see these in uh, some, some sedimentary rock layers, you know, you've probably got sandstone and shale and you've probably got salt crystal growth. Another way we can weather things physically is biological activity. So tree roots can grow down in here in the cracks in rock and wedge them apart and then these rocks will eventually fall off. Um, animals digging and other sorts of things also break apart rock um, mechanically. All right, so uh, there's a couple of really major ways that we weather rocks um, chemically. And so one is dissolution weathering. So some minerals are um, soluble in water, especially calcite. So calcite is the main mineral that makes up limestone and marble. And so we can see these two um, tombstones here. So this one's made of granite on the left. And you can see that you can read that very clearly, even though it was uh, carved in 1868. Um, this one on the right is made of marble, and you can't even really read the date here, but I think it says 1878. It's even uh, more recent than that one. Um, and you can, you can barely read that, and that's because rainwater over time, uh, rainwater is weakly acidic, there's dissolved carbon dioxide in it, and so that weakly acidic uh, rainwater will dissolve the calcite in the marble. Another major um, form of chemical weathering is called oxidation. And so oxidation is basically when you um, expose certain minerals to oxygen and it changes their chemical composition. Um, this is a really big problem in Colorado. Uh, we have what's called acid mine drainage. And that's where we have mines 
Um, and in these mine shafts, you're exposing rocks, especially sulfides. So we have a lot of sulfides like pyrite, which is iron sulfide, sulfide FES2. Um, sulfides are often associated with gold and silver and lead deposits, things that we're mining. So you expose these rocks, these sulfide rocks, to oxygen by drilling these mines and, and letting water and air in there. Um, and in this case, uh, pyrite creates sulfuric acid. Um, so then as the, the water drains out of these mines into streams and things, um, we're adding water or we're adding acid to the water and that creates a lot of problems um, for things that want to live in those streams. Um, another interesting thing, so when we, a result of weathering, especially when you talk about weathering rocks that are hard and resistant to weathering versus rocks that are soft and susceptible to weathering, we get really interesting landforms. So this is Mount Garfield and the Book Cliffs, which is uh, in western Colorado near Grand Junction. And here we can see at the top of this cliff, here's the Book Cliffs here, um, the top of that layer is sandstone, um, and it's a pretty hard sandstone that's very resistant to mechanical weathering. There's more sandstone here on top of Mount Garfield. Um, and then underneath the sandstone, we have a very thick layer of shale. This is the Mancus Shale, which is all over western Colorado. Now, typically when you have hard rocks that are resistant to erosion, they form cliffs like this. And if you have soft rocks that are susceptible to erode or to weathering, um, they form slopes like this. So here we have a cap rock, um, which means you have a hard rock, in this case sandstone, protecting softer rock shale um, that otherwise would have eroded away. Places where, this, where the cap rock is missing uh, will erode very rapidly, um, but the cap rock will protect that softer rock, leading to really interesting landforms. Um, and one place where we have a lot of really cool sedimentary rocks, we have different rock layers and we can look through the past, um, we have cap rocks and canyons, uh, is Colorado National Monument. And Colorado National Monument is located just outside of Grand Junction over here on the Colorado Plateau. So the cool thing about sedimentary rocks is they preserve um, evidence of what the past was like. So we call this depositional environments. So when sediments are deposited, um, they're deposited in different ways and you get different types of sediments depending on where you are. So in continental environments like lakes and rivers and deserts and, and glaciers, you're going to get different kinds of sediments than you would at shoreline environments or marine environments in the ocean. Um, so if you go and look at, at a sedimentary rock, and then you can say, okay, at the time that these sediments were laid down, uh, this was an ocean, or this was a lake, or this was a desert, um, which tells us a lot about the past. The other cool thing is, often fossils are preserved in these layers, and so we can look at the fossils and say, oh, these are the kinds of organisms that were living here at the time. Okay, so this is generally how we form sedimentary rocks, right? So sedimentary rocks are made up of sediments, so little pieces of sediment here. So here's one uh, here. Um, and we have two processes at work here. We have compaction and sedimentation. So compaction, basically what you're doing is when you bury sediments, um, or you, you put more sediments over top of, of existing sediments, you squeeze those ones that are down below and you squeeze out the water and the air um, and you compact the pore spaces between them. The other thing that can happen with cementation is new minerals can come in here and precipitate out of water and then glue those pieces together. Um, so with compaction and sedimentation, um, we call this lithification. Litha meaning stone or rock, so we're forming rock. Um, and so as an example of how we preserve um, evidence of the past in sedimentary layers, let's say we have a beach or a desert, and on beaches or desert, either wind or water is moving um, sand, uh, and we create these ripple marks, right? And so these ripple marks can be preserved. So here's some ripple marks in sand. And here's some ripple marks in sandstone. So this shows us that we had an ancient beach um, with uh, water or, or wind moving the, the sand into those ripple marks. So with our most common sedimentary rocks, um, we typically classify them by the kind of sediments that are in them. So for instance, here's fine sediments, uh, here's a gradient of fine sediments to coarse sediments. So fine sediments in mud like silt and clay are very small particles and they create a rock called shale. Um, coarser sediments like sand that you'd find on a beach or in a desert 
um, when we compact that, when we lithify that, we create sandstone. And coarse, even coarser sediments like gravel um, will be compacted into conglomerate. Um, you can also create sedimentary rock out of organic matter, so living things. Um, so if we have things in a, in a marine environment, so like um, uh, a shallow ocean basin or something, we have diatoms and algae and things like that. Um, if you bury those and, and compress them, we get petroleum or natural gas. Um, on a continental environment, you have plant material like you'd find in a swamp. Um, again, if you heat that and compress it, you get coal. We have some other types of sedimentary rocks that are formed by um, evaporation of water and leaving stuff behind. We call that precipitates, right? Minerals that are dissolved in water and then that water evaporates. What's left is called precipitate. And so our main uh, types of rock that you get from that is limestone. Limestone is made of calcite that is dissolved usually in ocean water and that um, ocean water evaporates and then leaves behind uh, limestone. Um, limestone is also created by some organisms that live in the ocean. So things that make shells, they can take calcite out of ocean water and excrete them to form their shells and that stuff can be compacted into limestone. So if you have limestone, you know you had an ocean there at one time. Uh, other sorts of minerals that can come out of precipitation is uh, gypsum and halite. Now the interesting thing about limestone, a, a precipitate that's made of calcite, and we talked about how it dissolves and it dissolves easily with from groundwater and from uh, precipitation. So marble is also made of calcite. Uh, it's a metamorphic rock which we'll get to in the next video. Um, but uh, it's susceptible to chemical weathering. So when you have limestone in an area, um, we can typically get the development of what we call karst topography. And karst topography just means the shape of the land, uh, the shape of the landscape uh, when you have limestone. We get all sorts of interesting features like sinkholes um, and underground caverns. Um, and, and disappearing streams. So you don't have a lot of streams on the surface because those streams go down underground into that limestone. Um, and it's because the groundwater will dissolve that limestone, it'll chemically weather it and create big caverns. So here's just another diagram of uh, karst topography. So again, uh, if our bedrock here is all limestone, um, we get caves forming. Um, our streams disappear because those streams will go down into a sinkhole and down into a cavern. Um, sinkholes form because as these as these caverns continually chemically weather, they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually um, they get so big that the roof uh, of the cavern gets too thin and can't support its weight and collapses. And so that's where you get sinkholes. Um, in those caverns, you get really interesting cave formations. This is a very famous cave, uh, Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico. Um, and so you have things, again, forming just like icicles. We have water dripping down from the ceiling. Um, there's calcite dissolved in that water, and that calcite comes out of solution and forms these interesting things like stalactites uh, coming down from the top of the cave, stalagmites down at the bottom. Uh, in some places, we get columns that are joined. Um, all of these cave formations are called speleothems, and they're all made from calcite. Um, and then, as I mentioned, sinkholes occur when um, the caverns get, uh, the, the roof of a cavern gets too thin to support its weight and collapses. And so here, this is a house in Florida, I believe. You can see how it collapsed, sinkhole collapse. These things can collapse suddenly without warning um, and swallowed up that whole house. And then you can see the neighbors here with the moving van, they're getting ready to get the hell out of there because this sinkhole will potentially get bigger and bigger. Anyway, so sedimentary rocks are really, really cool. Uh, that's it for those. And up next is metamorphic rock.